Good morning and welcome to worship here at Trinity Lutheran Church in Quakertown on this the third Sunday of uh, Lent. I think it's the third, yes, it's the second, it's only the second. Now oh, we're rushing things. Uh, it's good to be here with you today uh, to celebrate this uh, special day. And um, uh, it's uh, semi-sad uh, in that this is my last Sunday here with you, but that's good news because that means you're moving on to your next uh, stage in your interim process and you'll be having a new interim pastor start with you next week uh, and I'm on my way to other things and uh, so I can't say exactly what it is but uh, I will be going to another church um, and doing some stated supply and probably it'll be in the form of a, um, a bridge pastorate as well but um, so, uh, but I, it's not official yet, so I, I won't say anything more. I do want to, though, take this opportunity to, to thank you all for this wonderful opportunity I've had. It started, I was just supposed to be here uh, November and December, and here we are at the end of February, but it has been a truly uh, wonderful time. I really enjoyed myself, um, and I do want to uh, take a moment to thank some people. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Kevin and the, the council who have uh, their uh, support, their generosity, their, their love. Uh, it has been wonderful to work with you. I want to thank Mike and John and, and all the, the singers, uh, Denise and, and Diane and Logan, uh, who have helped keep the music going here, and, and the wonderful other um, folks who have been here, the dancer and the other soloists. And it's, it's just been marvelous, your music program here. And uh, the first couple of weeks we here, we had the praise band, and I miss not having them, uh, but that's certainly a wonderful element of, of your worship here. I want to thank the lectors. Uh, I want to thank the, the ones who have been what I call the COVID detectors, who have taken the, you know, our, uh, um, our temperature and make sure we're feeling okay, and mask and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, I want to thank Mike and John, of course, for their music and their leadership there. And finally, it can't, uh, the technical staff, Mike and Kevin, I think Logan's helped out, and uh, Kevin, I think your wife even has had some fingers in it. Uh, but it, without them, this all would just be the eight or so of us who are gathered here every week who would uh, have this service. But uh, with their, their knowledge, their skill, their dedication, we've been able to bring what I feel has been very supportive and, and wonderful, uplifting worship to you there at home. And last, but certainly not least, I have to thank Barbara. Um, Barbara is, she, she's, uh, any church secretary gets a, a gold star in my book. It's, it's one of the most difficult and thankless jobs. She's had to do it with me in, in strange circumstances. I think we've only been face to face, masked, uh, like twice. <laughs> and yet she's been there, she worked through COVID and other illnesses, and she's, she's just been wonderful to work with and I thank her. Her and I bless, you are blessed by her presence, so I, I uh, I'm so happy for you that you have her. Uh, and I probably have missed some folks, but uh, please just do know that I have enjoyed my time here, and um, I uh, certainly uh, uh, would be very excited about the prospect of in the future when uh, your pastor takes a vacation and needs somebody to come back and pinch hit, uh, that I might be uh, on that uh, call list. So. I'm sure we'll meet again. We, we met before. I was here before, and, uh, so, uh, and I'm not planning on going anywhere, so God's, it, God will guide us together, I'm sure. So having said that, uh, it is time for us to lead our, uh, uh, begin our worship, and as we do so, uh, to do so by turning our hearts to God to hear our confession and then to hear the resounding love of God's saving grace. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, 
pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy, and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined, and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus, as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven, and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And, and also, also with you.
Let us pray. O oh God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Today's first reading is a reading from Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you an ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall no longer call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to the nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from Romans. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be their heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of us, all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old. And when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb, no distress made him waver, considering the promise of God but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words, it was reckoned to him, were written not for his sake alone, for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who, do, who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for a justification. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. 
Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you, are, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If anyone want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it benefit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life. Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words are in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning, boys and girls. It's good to talk with you again today, and I've really enjoyed sharing this time with you. I wanted to talk to you today about believing in yourself. We hear a story about Abraham that was just read, a story about how God had made a promise with him that he would be the father of a great nation. But it's a story that sounds a little impossible. I mean, he was an old man. He was older than me at that time, and he yet didn't have children. But God said, I will make of you the father of a great nation. It sounds ridiculous, but Abraham kept faith, and God made it happen. I think that in my own life. When I was growing up, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do, and I was very involved in church work and, and youth uh, youth work in particular, and I really enjoyed that. And I kind of thought that maybe about the ministry, but I thought it's not going to happen for me. I was just an average student, and at that time, to get into seminary, which is where you go to be trained to be a pastor, you had to have taken Greek in college. I can barely speak English let alone any other foreign language. So I just figured that's not for me. So I went in another direction, into electrical engineering. I went to school for that. But God had something else in mind for me. And he kept having people kind of tell me to think about going in another direction. Sometimes I listened, but sometimes I kind of drug my feet and said, oh, it's never going to happen for me. And Yet things kept happening. And before you knew it, not only didn't you have to take Greek in college to get into seminary, but once you were in seminary, I was able to take my Greek that I needed in a, what's called a January intercession with just pass-fail. And I just squeaked through. You see, I didn't think that it was ever possible for me to be a pastor. Well, here I am. 42 years later, and I'm still doing that work and loving it. You see, God had a way of keeping me on track through other people. Sometimes the most important thing is you have to be willing to listen to what God has called you to do. And you might think it's impossible, that you can't possibly do that. But I want to encourage you to trust God. God will help you to do whatever it is that you put your mind to. For God has blessed you with many gifts. You're a child of God, and therefore, you're always watched out over. Let's pray. Gracious God, help us all to know when we are called to do what seems impossible, that nothing is impossible with you. 
Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus, who is the Christ. How big is your vision? Or maybe another way to put it, it would be, how grand is your imagination? How open is your mind? How unbelievable is the believable? Now, these are all questions that kind of I want to get you thinking into trying to deal with what often seems like the impossible being reality. We find ourselves, or you at Trinity, find yourselves at a time now when you're going to be spending a little bit of time talking about your past, but you're going to be spending a lot more time thinking about your future and talking about where it is you want to go, where it is, more specifically, that you believe God is calling you to go in your mission and ministry of serving Jesus Christ in this community of Quakertown. And I want to ask you, how open is your vision? Can you possibly envision a Trinity Lutheran church that has multiple services on a Sunday morning of both traditional and contemporary, with a, pop, with a worshiping Sunday population of 1,000, 1,500 on a Sunday? Can you imagine a church here at Trinity that is multicultural in its, in, in its mix? that it has people of all ages and a youth program from the littlest up through those in, in college and early adulthood. Can you imagine a Trinity Lutheran Church that stands on the forefront of being a place of social justice and ministry to, and outreach to those who are hungry and homeless, underemployed? Can you imagine things like that? And the list could go on. Can you imagine that? Is your vision that big? I hope it is. There's a part of me that the pessimistic side that says, I have seen far too many congregations that are more concerned about surviving than they are about living. And there's a big difference. You see, part of living in the word of Jesus Christ, part of that ministry that taking the risk is being able to have faith in what God sees as your mission in this place. And you know what? It may seem ridiculous for you to even think about any of those things that I just mentioned. Or is it? I mean, look at the examples that we have in the scripture. Our first lesson is a story about Abraham and Sarah. The story of the, it's actually the second covenant. Last week we had the first covenant with Noah. But this is the covenant God made with Abraham and Sarah that through them they would be the father and mother of a multitude of nations. Now it's one of the things that's important when we talk about Abraham as our father, we're not talking about a biological or racial father. What we're finding is that Abraham and Sarah are our faith parents. Okay? We are given the same faith that Abraham and Sarah had. Now, you can say, but Abraham, you know, Abraham is special. He, he's a patriarch. Abraham had super faith. And even Paul kind of tends to lead us in that direction. It says that Abraham's faith never wavered. I would want to remind Paul he needs to read back into the Old Testament. And the reality is there were a number of times that Abraham had some doubt. He tried to pass his wife off as his sister on two different occasions because he was afraid of what was going to happen. And of course, there's the whole story of who would be the inheritor, who would be the, the son who would receive the blessing. Abraham didn't have a son, and so when God came and said that he would be the father of a great nation, Abraham thought God needed some help. And so he took his, hand, his wife's handmaid, which was legal in that time, and had a child through her. Ishmael was his name. 
But you see, God had other plans. This is at least the third time in the scripture where God has come to Abraham and told him that he was going to be the father of a great nation. But this is the first time that he includes Sarah specifically. In other words, he's telling Abraham and us that Ishmael isn't the answer. That You see, when we think we know better how to do God's job, God says, mm -mm. There's an old saying, when humans make plans, God laughs. Now, that's not meaning we shouldn't make any plans and we should never try to do things, but we always have to do it based upon listening to what God has challenged us, to what God has called us to do. And that takes hard listening because a lot of times it seems impossible. And that's what Abraham and Sarah had to face. They were old. <laughs> There's no reason they should have been able to have children at that age. But God made it possible. He, this is really the first place that we see that God brought life out of death. And he did it to prove his point. That God had made a promise, had made a covenant with Abraham and Sarah, and with his descendants. And he would not abandon them. Now Paul does get that right. When Paul says um, that this was not just said for, for Abraham, but this was said for our sake as well. That we would know that that covenant promise is for us as children of God. It's not easy because often what God calls us to do goes against the way the world does things or the way the world thinks it should go. Peter found that out. What we don't see in the, or what we don't hear in the gospel lesson is what immediately precedes this text in chapter 8. And that's where Jesus has said to Peter, Peter, or he says to them, to his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they all kind of go, uh, you answer, Peter. <laughs> and Peter, kind of being the, the bold one, he stands up and says, you are the Mashiach, the Messiah, the anointed one, the promised Messiah. Well, yeah, he was right. And Jesus said, tells him, you're right. But this hasn't been shown to you by man. This has been shown to you by God. But Peter, you don't quite understand what it is you're saying. You don't quite grasp all the ramifications of that. You see, Peter's backstory, what he's thinking is going to happen is that as Jesus is coming as the new Messiah, the new king for the people of Israel, that he's going to be the one to rally the troops, to get Herod out of town, to push the Romans out of town, for them to be able to have, again, control of the promised land and live in freedom. And that's what he's envisioning. And he probably might even be thinking, along with his fellow disciples, that they're going to be now in positions of great power and prestige because they will be the right hand of God in Christ Jesus. And so when Jesus begins to explain to them what it means that he is the Messiah, that he is the one who's come to save, and that there's a process that's going to happen to make that possible, including going into Jerusalem where he will be arrested, put on trial, convicted, and then crucified. It's interesting. We talk about this as being the first of the three passion predictions. But we sometimes forget it's also the first of the resurrection predictions. Because he says, I will be crucified, and then in the third day rose, raised up. But Peter doesn't hear that. He doesn't even buy it. That's not what he had in mind. And so he pulls Jesus off to the side. And he says, Jesus, you can't say that. And Jesus said, Peter, get behind me, Satan. Because you're talking like humanity. You're talking about what the devil would want to do, not what God wants. And then he turns to the rest of the people gathered along with his disciples, and he talks to them about not just that he is the Messiah, which means he's going to have to go to the cross to die, 
but what that means for us now as we call ourselves disciples, followers of him. It means if we're going to truly follow him, it means we have to take up the cross as well. Now, I want to be clear here. Often, far too often, this text has been used as a justification of why it's okay for us to suffer. You know, that's the cross we bear. Well, it's interesting. In that text, the cross is always something we choose to carry. So that if something befalls us, it is not a cross that we bear. It's just suffering. By choosing the cross, it means we choose to walk a path that may well indeed cause some stress and some pain and some discomfort. And yes, in some cases, can be life-threatening. You see, and that's the challenge of a church today. How are you going to choose to pick up the cross? Because if you have any sense of a vision that's grand and glorious in terms of doing the ministry of Jesus Christ here, that it means that you are going to have to make some sacrifices. It means that you're going to have to step up and help lead that, that drive. And that's going to mean challenges and difficulties and some suffering. But it also is going to mean the carrying forth of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Because all those people that you reach out to, those who are hungry or hurting or disenfranchised in other places, who don't know a place where they can be accepted and loved, regardless of what their background is, what their gender is, what their age is, what their race is, that can be treated as equals because we know them to be children of God just like us. There'll be times when we mess up, just like Abraham. He wasn't perfect, see? Yeah, he did believe. He did have the faith to stick in there. Even after he made his mistakes, he kept listening and he kept following. And that's what God's called you to do here in this place. He's called us to take up the cross, to follow the challenge of being the disciples of Jesus Christ here, not doing things the way the world says it should be done, but standing up for the right of doing it the way God has called us to go. On one other note that strikes me in this text is this is a place where I really have to look hard, and I think we all have to look pretty hard at some of our leaders in our nation. And I'm not being partisan here. There's plenty of sin to go around. I think we start needing to hold our politicians and our leaders accountable to taking up the cross, especially those who are claiming to be Christians, and to hold them accountable for proclaiming the truth of being willing to take up the cross for the sake of honesty, for the sake of not hurting people, for the sake of the goodwill of the nation, for the sake of serving the people who have elected them to public office. You see, I think we as Christians need to stop not saying anything. Indeed, it may be a risk to speak out. That's what a lot of these politicians, why they're afraid to do that, because they're afraid they're going to lose the support. They might not win re-election. But there is that phrase, you know, you may be ashamed, uh, those, those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. I don't want to stop on that note, although I do think it's an important one. But rather, I do want to stop on a positive note. I believe that the church today, and not just Trinity, but the Church of Jesus Christ, 
is as strong and viable as it ever has been. But it's just as important that we not take that for granted. You here at Trinity, you have a special opportunity. You have a good, strong base, but your work is far from done. And I just hope that your vision, your dream, your expectation of what God has called you to do isn't too small. Don't be satisfied with getting back to what was normal. Instead, don't accept anything less than normal being God's work flourishing through you. It's taken some work. It'll take some sacrifice. There'll be some pain, some disagreement. But you are all children of Abraham, sharing the faith of Abraham and the promise of Jesus Christ, who died for us all. May God bless you in your journey. Amen.
Having heard the word of Jesus Christ, let us now proclaim our faith with the use of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. Your gift of grace is for all people. Give confident faith to all the baptized that they may follow you wholeheartedly. Give new believers joy in your promises. Give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. All the ends of the earth worship you. From galaxies to microorganisms, preserve your creation. Teach humanity to wonder at your works and join you in tending to the creation's well-being. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities that we cannot even imagine. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In Jesus, you join humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are sick or grieving, especially Bertha Golick, Colin Hoff, Darren Rice, Ann Scott, and Gary Scott, and those with ongoing prayer needs, and those that we name before you now. Bring vindication for victims of injustice, exploitation, and oppression. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You made Abraham and Sarah the ancestors of a multitude of nations. Bless grandparents, parents, and foster parents, and the children who look to them for care and guidance. Console those with, who deal with infertility, parents who have entrusted their children to adoption, and children longing to be adopted. Equip ministries and services to families. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Gracious God, we ask your blessings upon Trinity Lutheran Church as they enter into their new journey of their interim. We pray that your vision for them will be as grand as is possible, and that you enable them to see and understand your mission and the, and the glory of God that it will provide. I thank you for the time I've spent here and ask you to continue to bless me in my journey of service. Hear us, O God. We await the day of Christ's coming in glory. Lead us by the example of all the saints whom you have called 
to take up their cross and follow you, that together we may find our lives in you. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us join in praying the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning to everybody watching and joining us in worship today. Uh, obviously, we want to thank you, Pastor Hackman, for being with us. I'm sure uh, when we were thrown into this whole situation, I know Council's first priority was finding some sense of stability uh, in what we were told was the first four to six weeks <laughs> of the transition. And I'm sure that- uh, Weeks, months, yeah, it's all the same. Yeah, <laughs> it's just a matter it's of close. semantics. But uh, in all honesty, thank you so much for everything you did, helping us navigate through Advent and Christmas and here into the beginning of Lent. Um, there have been people sharing their thanks with you online today. And on behalf of council, I would just say that we Pray that the next congregation that you are leading finds your leadership to be as much of a blessing as we have. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Next week, we will be joined by our bridge pastor, uh, who is Reverend Dale Malloy. She will be joining us and leading us in the next step of the transition. Uh, so please make sure to join us next week uh, for her introduction to all of you. If you did not read the newsletter, which was sent out on Friday, she did contribute a letter there so you could get to know her a little bit. But I know that um, after council met with her, we are all looking forward to continuing to move along on this journey. This week, a couple of announcements. The office is closed tomorrow and Tuesday. Tuesday evening, the ladies' Bible study being led by Caitlin Gifford will start at 7 p.m. So if you have signed up for that, just a reminder, that begins this week. Thursday night is the Loaves and Fishes dinner over uh, at Yerger. We are in charge of it this month, so we will be distributing meals in a drive-up fashion. We do need some volunteers, if possible. Troy Waterman's going to be over in the kitchen around noon on Thursday, beginning with the meal prep. And uh, we will be distributing and cleaning up from 5 to 6.30. If you are able to help with the meal prep or the distribution, please get in contact with either Troy Waterman or Christina Torres to let them know that you would be able to help with that. We hope everybody is doing well, and we thank you again for joining us each and every week. Be well. We are what God made us to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, and free to serve our neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen.
Let us go in peace, live God's love for all. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.